here are 20 absolutely important functions that you need to know if you are currently a high school student. The simplest of these is the linear graph. Its equation is of the form y equals to mx plus c and has the shape of a straight line. In this particular straight line, m represents the number 1 and c represents the number 0. As we vary the number m, the steepness or the gradient of the function changes. And if m equals to 0, we obtain a horizontal line. The more negative m is, the steeper it is in a downward direction. This tells us that the gradient of the line is precisely m. Now what happens if we were to vary the number c? As we change the number c, the position of the line changes. This actually tells us that the y-intercept of the graph is given by the coordinate 0c. And this straight line graph can be applied to make sense of the speed of a moving object. It can be generalized to this strange functional form, but finds its greatest utility in the approximations in calculus, which is the area of math where we study change. A really crucial variation of the linear graph is the quadratic graph. This is given by an equation involving the term x squared, and in the simplest case, the shape of the quadratic graph is the shape of a u. For now, a represents the number 1, b represents the number 0, and c represents the number 0. If we were to change the number a, the graph would get stretched vertically. If instead the number a is negative, the u would get reflected about the x-axis giving us an inverted u. If we were to tweak b, we sort of tilt the u-shape in one direction. If b takes on a negative value, the tilt happens in the other direction. This is not a coincidence and we'll see what it represents in just a moment. Finally, the number c plays a very similar role that it did in the linear graph situation. It tells us where this graph is located and is encoded via the y-intercept 0, c. This graph has a special point called the turning point and is usually denoted by the symbol hk. Quadratic graphs help us model the distance traveled by a moving object and can be generalized to higher dimensions using this linear algebraic tool called quadratic forms. More generally, if we were to consider a higher degree polynomial, we would obtain polynomial functions. The highest power of x is known as the degree of the polynomial and is usually denoted by n. There are peculiar sum and product formulae. Many of you would also learn about some shortcuts known as the remainder and factor theorems pertaining these polynomials. And at the college level, you might even prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. Finally, you might even learn polynomials in the context of ring theory where you learn about the ring of polynomial functions. On the flip side, we could consider this idea of reciprocal functions, which are functions of the form 1 over x. The graph comes in two different branches, and the x and y axes are known as the asymptotes of the function. This function comes into play when we talk about how the variables x and y are inversely proportional to each other, and also features in the ideal gas law in physics. In calculus, the derivative of the logarithm function is 1 over x, but more on the logarithm function later on. If instead we consider the reciprocal function 1 over x squared, we obtain the basics of the inverse square law, which is responsible for Newton's law of gravitation, as well as some properties pertaining electric fields. Increasing the power on x would cause the graph to become more steep as well as alternate on the left side. Another important function is known as the square root function. This is the function square root of x and increases at a decreasing rate on the positive x-axis. This function is featured in the famous quadratic formula that almost every student even after graduation, vaguely remembers. By considering higher degree roots, 
we obtain the general nth root functions, which are in general surprisingly not enough to solve equations involving x to the 5. In other words, this equation does not have a solution that comes in a neat package like the quadratic formula. After algebra, one might learn trigonometry and encounter the sine graph. The basic shape is that of a sinusoid wave. And let's first consider the term omega, which has the number 1. As omega increases, the number of times the wave oscillates increases as well. Omega here is known as the angular frequency of the wave. The Greek letter phi here is currently set at 0, and when we change phi, we change the starting position of the wave. This is known as the phase of the wave. And we're going to set the phase to equal 0 for now. Finally, considering the term A, if we were to increase the term A, the highs and the lows of the sine graph would get taller. A here is known as the amplitude of the graph, and we're going to set A to equal 2. The amount of time taken for the sine graph to repeat itself is known as the period of the graph, and this period is directly connected to the angular frequency. In fact, it is equal to 2 pi divided by the angular frequency. Sine waves are incredibly useful in modeling simple harmonic motion, as well as some basic properties involving light and sound waves. Closely connected to the sine graph is the cosine graph, which is similar to a sine graph, with the exception that it starts on the top, at least when the phase is zero. This similarity is not a coincidence and can be established using trigonometric identities. For a proof of these identities, check out the video in the video card. But before that, since we've seen the sine and cosine graphs, Let's take a look at the tangent graph. The tangent graph seems a little bizarre since it blasts away to positive and negative infinity at some points. And the special lines that describe this behavior are known as the asymptotes of the graph. Tangents are useful in making sense of gradients, which comes into play when studying calculus and even the study of complex numbers. Just like the sine and cosine graphs, the tangent graph also has a period. In fact, any function that repeats itself after a certain amount of time t is known as a periodic graph. These will include the reciprocal trigonometric functions such as the cotangent graph, as well as the reciprocal of the sine graph known as the cosecant graph. Finally, we have the reciprocal of the cosine function known as the secant graph, which is a shifted version of the cosecant graph. From algebra and trigonometry, one naturally learns about calculus and its most important function, the exponential graph. And the graph increases at an increasing rate. Here, we first suppose that f of 0 equals to 1 and k equals to 1. We're going to see how these numbers affect the shape of the graph in just a moment. As we change f of 0, the starting amount changes. This causes the graph to increase much more quickly or much more slowly. This is known as the initial amount in the exponential graph. We're going to set that to 1 for now. As k changes, the original steepness of the graph changes as well. Interestingly enough, k would encode the growth rate of the exponential model. This graph is responsible for the math of continuously compounding interest. It also has the very special property that its derivative equals itself. This is the only function that does this. And let me know in the comment section if you want me to prove this result. Finally, this model is responsible for viral infections, at least in terms of its initial stages. If instead we had the equation e to the negative of kt, we would obtain an exponential decay. The numbers k and f of 0 play a similar role that they did in the case of exponential growth. However, k now does not represent the growth rate, but rather the decay rate. This decay rate is actually responsible for the half-life when analyzing radioactive decay involving radioactive substances. More generally, if we consider the general exponential graph, Interestingly enough, f of 0 still measures the initial amount.
while A captures the growth rate. If A equals to 1, then the graph remains constant at f of 0. And if A is smaller than 1, we obtain the exponential decay model. Once again, setting A as the multiplier, this helps us calculate the effect of compounding interest. The inverse of the natural exponential graph is the natural logarithm graph. Its general equation is ln of x minus c. And as we change the value of c, the value that this function is limited by also changes by c. In this case, we call x equals to c the asymptote of the logarithm function. Let's set c to equal 1. If we consider the general base, we will get the logarithm base a of x minus c. As a changes, the stretchiness of the function changes as well. In some sense, a measures the stretchiness of the function, but for more details, check out the document in the description box below. Logarithms help us solve exponential equations that arise from the exponential growth and decay models. These graphs in calculus are rather well behaved as compared to the absolute value function, which looks like a V-shaped graph with a point at the origin. From the graph, we can see that the absolute value of x is non-negative, and if the absolute value of x equals 0, the input must be 0 as well. We can also pull out constants from the absolute value function, and we have that the absolute value of a sum is upper bounded by the sum of the absolute values. These properties are crucial in the study of real analysis, which forms the theoretical underpinnings of calculus. But the absolute value function is defined in two pieces and is known as a piecewise function. There are many more ill-behaved functions that are of crucial importance in calculus, which you can check out in the video here.